September 16th, 2015 meeting of the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. Please rise and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, liberty and Thank you. <clears throat> Mrs. Zambrano, please call the roll. Commissioner Pletcher. Present. Vice Chair Reeder. Here. Chair McMahon. Here. And Commissioners Engler and Simpson are absent. Um, item number four is a commendation for our outgoing Commissioner Susan Engler. Um, she is someone who has devoted her life to helping the community, and um, at this point, she is a supervisor for the Red Cross and has been called up north to help the people who are um, victims of the fire. And so we have this beautiful commendation of the things that she's accomplished here as a commissioner, but I think we're going to hold off and try to get her back um, and and read this in person and, and talk about her in person because uh, she we really want to say some nice things to her and not about her. Okay, so we'll save that. And then, um, let's see, And uh, item number five is the oath of office for our newly appointed traffic commissioner. Commissioner Tom Gregory is back. <laughs> And I'm just going to provide the oath, and then you can say I do or I will at the end. Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which you're about to enter. I will. Okay. If I could have you sign your oath right sure. here. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. As we are rearranging nameplates, I'm going to read our, uh, our uh, disclaimer. Uh, any person who wishes to speak regarding an item on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction during the public comments portion of the agenda must file a purple public, speak public speaker card with the recording secretary before that portion of the agenda is called. Any person wishing to speak on a specific agenda item must file a public speaker card before the specific item is called. Persons addressing the Traffic Commission are requested to state their name and city of residence for the record. Under state law, issues presented or introduced under public comments can have no action and will be referred to the Traffic Engineering Division Manager for administrative action or to be scheduled on a subsequent agenda. It would be appreciated if you'd silence all cell phones during the meeting. Also, as TOTV can only record your comments while speaking into the microphone, there should not be any dialogue between the audience and the commissioners unless you're at the podium. If you are unable to come to the podium, or should you need to step away from the podium while speaking, a wireless microphone is available for your convenience. Okay. Um, let's see. Item number seven, summary notes. Are there any questions or comments on the summary notes? Okay, uh, let's see. Item 8, the engineer's reports. Um, 8A, the flashing yellow left turn left traffic signals. Is that um, Mr. Sweeting? Yes. Okay. Hello, welcome, and good evening, Commissioners. Uh, I am Robert Sweeting, one of the uh, associate traffic engineers. And tonight, we are going to ask the commission for their recommendation uh, to the city council regarding the implementation of flashing yellow arrows. 
as noted in recent articles in the newspaper and asked by fellow commissioners, uh, we have been asked to look for ways to reduce left turn delays at traffic signals. And one of those ways is a newly um, designed feature called a flashing yellow arrow. So I'm going to give you some information regarding um, the flashing yellow arrows that the staff has obtained uh, for your consideration uh, and your recommendation. So first, I'd like to go over some of the background information regarding uh, traffic signals and how they um, come about for their um, type of use. Um, we use the Federal Highway Administration flowchart um, that looks at collisions, speed limits, volumes of left turns versus through, uh, site visibility, opposing through lanes, and a number of other, uh, a number of left turns to determine what type of signal indication should be uh, recommended, whether that is a permissive, protected, or protected permissive, which is a combination of the two. And I'm going to show you what some of those are. Right now in the city of Thousand Oaks, we have, uh, by left turn lanes, we have 31% are permissive, the majority of them at 61% are protected, and uh, a handful of them are protected permissive and split phased. So this signal here, this description here, um, is one of a permissive. It's just three uh, indications, the red, yellow, green, um, which allows left turners, let me get my arrow here, left turners to make a left uh, when it is clear to do so, so there's no opposing through traffic. And also they want to make sure that there are no pedestrians. So this is the simplest uh, of the three uh, indications. Um, it also uh, generally has higher collision rates, which I'm going to show uh, later, but it also has the least amount of delays. Next we have our just pure protected signal. Um, this one here is where you can only make a left turn on the protected arrow with the green, yellow, red arrows. Um, this one here generally is the safest of the indications. However, it also creates the most delays, especially when we have coordination on our some of our main streets being Thousand Oaks Boulevard, Hillcrest, Moore Park Road, uh, and Lynn Road. So the longer we have cycle lengths to get coordination, generally the longer the delays. Next is the protected permissive left turn. This one is kind of a hybrid of the two. It has left turn arrows over here to the left side of the signal head, and then the permissive balls on the right side of the head. Um, and then this far left indication is kind of also a combination for the um, left turners to be able to see that. So the way it would generally work um, is that it would come up with the green arrow first, followed by the yellow arrow, followed by the red ball. Then once that is finished and this through movement begins, then a green ball will come up, and I have a, a picture of that on the next slide. Then left turners may then make and proceed a left turn, provided that again, that there's no opposing left turns or pedestrians. So as this green movement continues, they can make a left turn. Now this one also kind of offers a combination of both where um, it reduces some of the delay um, along with the protection of the traffic signal. So here's one of those pictures here and ideally you'd want to see a head over the this left turn arrow. But as you can see in this upper left picture, it kind of shows a combination of the arrow and the uh, red ball. So with this, sometimes it can be confusing with this style, and this was called a doghouse style that was referred to, because uh, it shows just the left turn, but for the through movement it's showing a red ball, so at times it could be confusing. And we have about seven of these uh, in town still. Um, or if it's permissive, where you can make a left turn, it would just show the green ball. 
Next is what we're going to, is another form, is a new form of a protected left turn, and that is the flashing yellow arrow. That's what we're here uh, to basically talk about. With this, it kind of separates out from that doghouse style. It puts the permissive for the through movement and puts the left turn protection in its own lane. And what this does is how this would work is that you would start off with a green arrow, followed by a yellow arrow, then to a red arrow. Then when this through movement begins, it's tied directly to the flashing yellow. So then the flashing yellow begins to flash for the remaining duration of this green ball indication, which then allows the left turners to make a left when it's available to do so, and there's no conflicts with pedestrians on this left side as well. So this one is a little bit easier to be understood than the other type of, of uh, doghouse style protected permissive left turn. Um, I'm going to be discussing in a moment um, about approach turn collisions. So, and I wanted to sh use this as an illustration as to what that is. When we're looking at the types of signals, whether it's protected, permissive, we're looking at generally uh, the worst type of collision, which is an approach turn collision, which is meaning this through movement has in this left turn. So that's the approach turn collision, and that's what we're trying to help um, correct generally. So here is a picture of what a typical four-section flashing yellow uh, head would look at, look like, and what the position would be. So typically you would have this four section right over the left turn lane with the two, or, or could even be a single um, red, yellow, green ball for the through movement. And then here is the photo kind of showing and emphasizing that same thing. And again, just to reiterate, is when this flashing yellow is going off that you do need to yield the right of way to the opposing left turns I mean, to the opposing through movement and pedestrians. This slide here uh, illustrates, uh, this kind of is all tying back to some of why when we look at that FHWA flow chart of when we install um, signals, why so many uh, protected left turns went in. Um, so this is, this slide shows a, uh, protected left turn, how many generally at an intersection, these are some of our higher um, volume intersections that typically we would see about 6% of approach turn collisions at these type of intersections. Um, whereas at protected permissive, we're looking at around 36%. So of our seven intersections that are still protected permissive, uh, we have about 36% collision rate of the approach turn. So of all collisions that, are, that occur there, that's the type or the style that is occurring. So people aren't generally adjusting to the gaps that are needed. Um, so as we do our um, 10 most common locations for collisions, we're looking at what the pattern is there, why, why are those occurring, and sometimes we have to make adjustments uh, to that. So recently we did one over at Hillcrest and McLeod where we had a permissive going north-south and about 70 percent of our collisions were the approach turn collisions. We've since put in protected there and those collisions have gone away. So it's not that we're always looking to do that but we do look at some of the, this history. And again at just permissive intersections, we have about 22 locations that have speed limits of 35 miles per hour or greater, and again, it's about 36%. When you get to speeds of 40 miles per hour, if you take out the 35 mile per hour ones and you just look at those that are over 40, that number increases to 47%. So there are some considerations to look at, and that, that's what we look at when we're looking at uh, collision rates, is to see if there is a pattern. So. We have talked to some of our colleagues um, in, in that have flashing yellow arrows within the state, and one of the first ones to in institute it was the city of Fullerton. Uh, Mark Miller from that town um, instituted it there and also in Torrance. Um, so 
I'm not sure if you can see the slide, but it shows that with the flashing yellow arrow, they've actually had increases in the left turns, and they've had increases in the uh, amount of volume in the the uh, through movement. So at both the intersection of Chapman and Commonwealth, and at Lemon Street and Orange Thorpe, um, but with that, they also had some increase in collisions. So before, where they were averaging about one a year prior to 2005, and in the next three years they're averaging about two a year. So not a great increase, but still a slight increase. Could be due to the increase in volume that they're also putting through. Uh, at Lemon Street, they went from zero prior to that to um, up just shy of three. Uh, and that's where they also went from a protected only signal to a protected permissive signal. So there are some uh, potential consequences with changing uh, to a protected permissive or flashing yellow arrow. Some of the benefits of a flashing yellow arrow are that obviously they minimize delay, which is uh, one of the key elements. And with that, it would improve your air quality, reduce air commissions. Uh, the flashing yellow arrow is better understood uh, because of the position of the uh, signal heads. Um, it increases the left turn capacity, and it also increases the through movement. Um, it also allows for better coordination of the traffic signals along those corridors where some of those delays um, because of the higher uh, coordination patterns have to occur. We generally have anywhere from 90 to 120 second cycle lengths. One of the added benefits with the flashing yellow arrow is that with some of the newer controllers you can actually put in a time of day use where you can say during the commuter hours where it's heaviest we can put in a time of day where the flashing yellow can't come up. It would only be the protected and sometimes during the non heavier times or non peak times can go back to then the, the flashing yellow arrow. So there are some uh, new advantages to having the flashing yellow arrow. Here are some, there's about a dozen or so cities within California uh, that are currently using flashing yellow arrows. Uh, Fullerton and Torrance again were some of the first ones to use it. The only one in Ventura County is Oxnard. They have one that they installed about six months ago at the uh, intersection of Rice and Camino del Sol. Some other noteworthy information is that the city of Santa Clarita actually had about three of them in and after two years they took them out because they did have higher collision rates. Uh, the city of Pasadena installed them because of their metro rail line, not necessarily because of delays, but they needed to find some additional gaps to allow left turns so they wouldn't back out into the through lanes um, on the main street. So they put in the flashing yellow to allow for some additional gaps to make those left turners. Uh, the city of Las Vegas, Henderson and North Las Vegas installed about 200 of them in the last year. Uh, but they only put them in where existing protected permissives were, uh, the doghouse style. So they did not just put them in everywhere, so only where the protected permissives. So as you can see, there's a lot of different reasons why people put them in. Uh, the city of La Habra said they had collisions go up for the first year, but for the following two years after that, they had no collisions. So there, there was a kind of a break-in point, if you will, a learning point um, for people to understand what the flashing yellow uh, is about. So if, depending on your recommendations, we have about five locations as a pilot program that we would consider as, along with you and the, and the city council. Um, some of the key to those successes for the in implementation of those that are kind of key elements of those five locations is that they have uh, low collision history, the site distance is good, the vehicle speeds are less than 45, and they have three or less opposing through lanes. Some places that we cannot um, install them would be where there's dual lefts or triple lefts. Uh, for instance, at a, like a Westlake and Thousand Oaks Boulevard where we have triple lefts, we wouldn't install them. Um, the signal head alignment is important. So some places where we've got um, some locations where you might think it might be a good location, it is, but the signal mast arm does not align with the left turn pocket. So it needs to align with the left turn pocket to be a good installation. And then lastly, um, we can't do it where uh, intersections are split phased. So here's an example of Fullerton that shows 
what one of the things that they did is they made this offset. You can see they they restriped the the left turn pocket used to be here, and then they made what's called a positive offset. So they pushed the left turn pocket over to the left. So now the visibility of the oncoming through traffic is is better aligned. And the same thing if you're over in this left turn pocket, it's better aligned um, to have good visibility. The second part of this is that they also had uh, the uh, left. The, the signal head is over or aligned over the left turn pocket. So those things were all good um, uh, qualities to, to implement a flashing yellow arrow. The cost for implementing this would be about $7,500. Um, we'd have to put in, change out the three section heads to four section heads, uh, install controllers, uh, conflict monitors, do some additional wiring. Um, if it's not one of the newer intersections that can accommodate it. If it's an older intersection, it can cost anywhere from thirty to eighty thousand dollars because we'd have to replace the cabinet, um, as, as, in addition to the controller, and install new poles to make sure that that left turn head is over the left turn pocket. Some of them are only to the middle of the roadway. For instance, if you look at one at Herbs in Las Flores in front of the junior high, it only goes to the middle of the road. It does not extend all the way over to the left turn pocket. So therefore, we'd have to install new poles in order to make that happen. Um, so there is a cost involved with that. But just for some of the ones we've uh, looking at as a pilot program, it'd be about $7,500 uh, per location. Um, this here is your new California 2015 handbook from the DMV and up here it's kind of hard to see but right up here it does show as an indication that there is a flashing yellow uh, as an indication that you need to be aware of uh, for the state of California so it is a recognized uh, indication and then we have um, if we were to proceed with this we would also uh, much like the city of Torrance did provide a uh, pamphlet or handout that would explain how it um, operates and so that's part of it'd be public awareness get the information out as to how uh, they operate we'd have a link on our website showing and then also the city of Torrance which we would do our own but uh, the city of Torrance has a animation that I'm going to try to sh pull up here um, on YouTube um, that kind of explains how this flashing yellow arrow works so we'll see if I can't Pull that up here for you. You may have noticed a new style of traffic signals being installed in the city of Torrance. They're called flashing yellow arrows, and they're designed to better control left turns and improve safety at intersections. The new signal of flashing yellow arrow means that a left turn is allowed, but you must yield to pedestrians and oncoming traffic. Oncoming traffic does have a green light and the right of way. When approaching an intersection, a steady green arrow means drivers making a left turn have the right of way. The oncoming traffic does have a red light and must stop. The steady yellow arrow means drivers should turn left with caution because the signal is about to turn red. Drivers should watch for oncoming traffic and, if possible, stop safely before the intersection. If drivers are in the intersection on a steady yellow, they should proceed safely and complete the turn before the light turns red. And, of course, the steady red arrow still means come to a complete stop. Now the flashing yellow arrow, the newly introduced signal, indicates that a left turn is allowed, but drivers must yield to pedestrians as well as oncoming traffic, as they do have a green light and the right of way. Just remember, a flashing yellow arrow means yield to pedestrians and oncoming traffic. For more information, contact the City of Torrance Public Works Department at 310 -7 Um, so that's basically the animation that we would look to do something similar to to get out to the to the public to let them understand how um, it's supposed to operate. And lastly, the uh, so the next step is basically for uh, the commission to make a recommendation um, based on on your information, uh, and if that's to go forward, then we'll obviously take that to city council for their consideration. 
And then we would also be doing some uh, before and after studies to show the effectiveness of the flashing yellow, which would include delays, collisions, um, and uh, volume to see whether or not we've had any increases as well. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, <clears throat> do we have any questions of staff? Go ahead. Um, throughout your presentation, thank you for that, uh, by the way. Uh, throughout your presentation, you mentioned a few additional safety measures, the time of day use, the push pocket, you know, uh, comparison with Irvine, um, and then the pamphlet and handout. Were, any, were the time of day use, was, was that con in consideration? Was it going to be implemented if we choose to go forward with these five signals? It's definitely a consideration because it'll be a tool. I mean, I think we would first look at what are some of our volumes are, whether there is a time of day. If we end up with a collision history, if we implemented it, we could then implement it after. Uh, so let's say a place on Thousand Oaks Boulevard that we're looking at at Duesenberg, if everything runs fine, then there would be no need to put in a time of day. But if we find that we are having a higher collision rate, maybe from four to six, then maybe we can implement that time of day use. So it's something that we can always use uh, to implement. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I do have a couple. Uh, do we know the nature of the injuries, like in Santa Clarita? You know, when there's uh, when it when there is an actual collision. What's this, can anybody tell us what the severity of that is? I mean, is it serious, life-threatening? I mean, was people hurt, or are we just talking fender benders? Uh, talking with the engineer, he did not indicate the type of collisions that were occurring, just that they went up. But typically speaking, that approach turn collision and a right-angle collision are your most severe uh, collisions, side swipes, rear ends we wouldn't expect with that type of a sig signal indication. But approach turn, I mean, I can't speak for uh, every collision uh, that occurs. I'm sure uh, Mr. Clifton would know better <laughs> seeing that than I would. But uh, uh, just from our nature of seeing of our collision reports, typically your approach turn collisions have more injuries than, than not. So, But the, the engineer there did not specify the type of collisions in Santa Clarita, no. Right. Okay. Um, just as a follow-up question, also, uh, when when it goes into flashing yellow, how is the crosswalk uh, indicator time for that? I mean, is it is it solid telling people not to enter that, or is it still blinking, or is there a countdown? Uh, what's what's the relationship between a you know, pedestrian when that goes flashing? In other words, could he literally put himself in that person that's now made a commitment because he's pulled out to make a left hand turn and block that person because maybe he entered late or you know if you could give me some insight? Uh, no, the the pedestrian would be exactly the same as a at a permissive right now. Once the signal turns green. Um, the crosswalk would activate, and so would uh, the flashing yellow for the person to start crossing. So he has to yield that right away. The flashing yellow. The flashing does. would. It would have to yield right. just like any other permissive indication. Right. Um, so what would happen is, again, at the beginning of the indication would be the, the green arrow, a yellow arrow, red arrow, and then one, because that's the protected movement, so they're allowed to cross, so pedestrians aren't crossing at that point. Correct. Then once that's done and the green ball comes up, then the pedestrian would get their indication to start crossing. The driver would then get their flashing yellow, but then again, they have to yield that right away to the pedestrian, just like any other permissive uh, indication as you would right now. Right. So, so they would still. So it so basically they still, still need to severely watch out for pedestrians. Ab absolutely, they are notorious at entering late. Yeah, but in <laughs> this case, they, they can't go. I mean, if there's cross traffic immediately, then they're going to have to wait for that cross traffic, right. just like any any other permissive indication. Because on more than one occasion, I've seen where somebody went out, wanted to go, a pedestrian started to cross, and literally the light changed. But the pedestrian was in the car's way, so they could not go. And I've seen the guy start to make a left, and the pedestrian literally be 
just oblivious to the fact that he was blocking that intersection. That car was stuck out there. So I have a little concern about that. You know, if it can be engineered, you know, not to have that conflict, I'd feel a lot more comfortable. But if you have any statistics, I mean, you're, you you said you were talking about car collisions, but are there any pedestrian collision statistics in all this? Well, not not directly to the flashing yellow at this point, right. one because we don't have that, but we can look up pedestrian to um, uh, vehicle collisions uh, right. through our software, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were due to a left turn. It could be right. due to a right turn. It could be due to uh, okay. several other factors. Uh, we could bring that, you know, find that information, bring it back at another time, but we don't have that particular information right now. I, I have a little bit of a concern about that. It may not be warranted, but I've also seen people driving, you know, bicycles on sidewalks the wrong way. And they act like they're pedestrians and just drive through everything. So, you know, I have a little concern on that. Um, the other thing in your packet was that uh, for these five locations of your recommendation, I just wanted to confirm the total cost for doing all five is the thirty-seven five hundred, right? That would be correct. Okay, good. All right, and then uh, I just have one other uh, thing I'll mention right now. Uh, but if we were to move forward tonight on this, I don't know if we are or aren't. Uh, one of the locations here, the Moore Park Road and Thousand Oaks High School driveway, um, due to the nature of new drivers, you know, driving to and from the high school, I would suggest we add some education pamphlets, you know, as a must for that location. Not that the parents, I mean, the kids might actually know better than the parents because it will they will just be learning <laughs> and they'll learn something new right off the bat. But I was also wondering if it's the entrance way that I'm thinking of, uh, if we could be in that same situation where I'm talking about pedestrians walking across that driveway, you know, and I'm trying to remember if that actually has a crosswalk or if, is that just a sidewalk or does that have like a pr protected crossing right there at that driveway? Uh, yes, there is a, a crosswalk there, and as you were talking about or asking before, that would be actually maybe an ideal location to try out the time of day use. So in the morning when it's heaviest uh, in the morning, um, we could put in a time of day where only the protection would come up and it would not have the flashing yellow. Then once school is essentially started at, say, 8.15, we bring on the flashing yellow for the rest of the time when it's not right. overly used. Uh, yeah, good Another point. part of the, that answer would be yes, we would give the uh, not only them but the park district that is there uh, information for their users and the school to give out to their drivers. And yes, anybody else would be happy to give out that information right. to help educate them. But this would also be kind of a lower volume, if you will, location to where help to implement uh, this program uh, to where so we're not just throwing it at high density high location so we're trying to educate people let them use and that's one good user to start right. using it and and back to my you know uh, pedestrian conflict issue i don't think any of these driveways have a lot of uh, pedestrian crossings that i've ever noticed driving in any of them so i mean it's not like a high volume of pedestrian traffic <laughs> no not not that not, not should a, also be on the no. safety factor that right. there is no one really actually crossing so all right thank you you're welcome Commissioner, did you have any questions? Yes, please. Thank you, Robert. Good, uh, good report. Um, it seems like the residents that uh, are concerned about waiting at, at traffic intersections when there's no opposing traffic are um, more concerned with uh, ability to move across town easily. And uh, I, I would suggest that we install these at low volume. Um, intersections because this I think is where people get most frustrated when they're sitting at a red arrow and there's not a car in sight so I, I appreciate you uh, mentioning that in in your presentation and my only concern would be the Duesenberg Teal intersection I went down there at, during uh, high traffic times uh, between 4 and 6 o'clock and there aren't any gaps really in the westbound traffic so during that period, I would highly recommend that we have that signal timed to not allow um, permissive turns during heavy traffic hours. It's mainly to protect us, too, in that uh, this is an experimental area 
for us to uh, implement these for the city. And I just would love if there weren't any tra traffic incidents anywhere in the next six months after we, if we should implement this. So that would be my only concern that the Duesenberg Teal intersection is uh, a little too crowded to, to do an initial uh, traffic uh, thing for 24 7. I understand your concerns. Um, that was just one of the locations that we were looking at because similarly down the road um, at Auburn and we had some other protected permissives uh, further down the road at also at Marmon but not at Auburn, I, uh, pardon me, um, Packard. <clears throat> so we have several others that are along that same corridor. Uh, there are gaps. Yes, it is busy, but again, with the availability of the time of day use, we could prevent that if we did see collisions um, increase. There are gaps that are created because down at Auburn, down at Packard, as we're doing coordination, we do kind of create some artificial gaps once they go through to allow um, some additional traffic. But yes, but during the heavy times, it may be something that we want to uh, put in a time of day use. But all of this is kind of, I don't want to say experimental, but we have to learn along the way with some of our other colleagues as we've done uh, what is the best practices uh, for each location. And to answer your other concern is to some of the lower um, intersections, generally at 70% of our intersections we have what's called running free. They just run by demand. So there shouldn't be a lot of extra undue delay at some of those intersections. Where we typically find the most delay is that when we have uh, intersections, much like Thousand Oaks Boulevard, let's say right out here at Dallas Drive, where we have to coordinate around Herbs Road and Canelo School, the amount of time to get everybody there coordinated and synced up is far more than what is needed at the Lakes or Dallas Drive. Therefore, there is a lot of unused time at some of those locations looking or appearing as though um, there's nothing going on when the signal should be changing. And that's where the flashing yellow would come in to help with coordination. And if we can reduce some of the left turns, we can actually maybe minimize the coordination time maybe bring it down from 120 to 100 second cycles because if we can clear some of the left turns we don't need 40 seconds we might only need 20 seconds because we can clear some of those cars during that time so there are some other benefits to having it but we have to make sure we put them in the right locations and that's why we're trying to pick some of these locations strategically to show that they are um, done correctly and uh, for the right use and then we can proceed from there Are there any other questions? Commissioner? Just a uh, follow-up to the time of day use. You, you mentioned that we could put in the initial light and then come back and look at whether we wanted the time of day. Would, this, would that timeline be on that year um, evaluation that we'd look, look at maybe putting in the time of day use, or would it be a sooner? Uh, good evening. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, we, you know, as, as we talk about this and being that this is a, you know, a, a, um, a pilot study, uh, we, we, may, we may ease into this and start out conservatively by um, controlling the time of use initially at some of these intersections, specifically at the school, possibly on T.O. Boulevard, get people used to the new technology, see how it works maybe during the non-peak hours, and then as we gain some comfort and some information, some data, then at that point we could we could expand the use if we think it's – I think is where you're going. With that well, question. yeah, that, that is – because my one hesitation is really the public safety and just getting the public familiar with what these lights are, what these lights do, because, I mean, in your presentation you mentioned that it is included in the new uh, California DMV manual, but – like so many, I renew my license and hardly get a real honest glance at it, at anything else that it may come with it. Sorry, Sergeant. But, I mean, I'm just, you know, being honest, and I feel like probably a lot of other people do the same. Um, so just as a quick follow-up, I mean, I would like to hear uh, the Sergeant's opinions with um, just on this entire the light change and whatever he feels like adding. I realize it's an open question, but uh, just wanted to hear it more from the public safety, what you see and what you've heard. I um, 
I like the idea of going at it slow, the way, the way we're talking about doing. I don't see an issue with it. I, I like the idea of having people move across town, like you were talking about earlier, as, most, as efficiently as they can. I think you're being as careful as you can with the design that you have, and I would support it. I don't, I don't see, you know, it's not a big drastic change. You're being very careful with selective intersections and the, and the timing of it. See it working. Great, thank you. Anything else? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. First of all, I would like to thank the staff because it's not often that residents complain, voice concerns, write letters, and a city actually does something. And you guys, you listened to the complaints, you read the letters to the editor, and you actually came up with a, a probably viable solution, and I think that's pretty really nice. And I, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I think that's awesome. And the second thing I want to make a comment on Commissioner Gregory's concerns about the pedestrians um, blocking those left turn, <clears throat> excuse me, drivers. Um, there's something I learned uh, not that long ago that I never knew. And that as ta I was talking to other people, and I did talk about it at a previous meeting, but we need to get this out there. When you step into an, ex an intersection as a pedestrian, if the light is flashing red, that's illegal. You're not supposed to go. And I didn't know that for the, until a few months ago, and I don't think people know that. If people would not step into the internet intersection when it's flashing, you wouldn't cause this problem that Commissioner Gregory is concerned about. So let's get that information out there. Okay. So um, if there are no other questions of staff, is there any discussion? I just have one other thing. Now, uh, we aren't considering putting that doghouse style in at all. That's like an older type, correct? Because I find that very conf confusing. And I believe in the past I actually went up against one, and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> So the ones that, that you have presented, thank you. I think that's the right choice. And I like all the information you presented. It's it's pretty thorough. It gives us enough to make a decision. Um, let's see. Are, is there any more discussion? Comments? A motion? Five motions? I can make a motion. Commissioner? Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, to approve the five locations that staff is recommending, uh, with the condition that you know the time of day adjustments are made initially to make sure everything is eased in properly. Uh, also, with the uh, uh, added recommendation that at the school we do a little uh, increased education. Uh, and we might even ask the students there to bring these things home to their parents because some parents still drive their students and they use those same roads. So uh, that would be my motion. Okay. Um, let's have a vote. When your name is called, please say yes or no. Commissioner Gregory? Yes. Commissioner Pletcher? Yes. Commissioner Excuse me, Vice Chair Reeder. Yes. And Chair McMahon? Yes. The motion carries four to zero. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Item 8B, the countywide bicycle safety. Um, that's an information item. Is there any discussion on that? Um, any Sorry, uh, this is the grand jury report? Um, the grand jury, um, I think because there was a lot of accidents in Oxnard, they um, uh, had an investigation, and this is the result of the, of the investigation. And um, uh, Mr. Mashiko, are you going to discuss it? Um, no, no, this is just an information item, just to let you know that this item did appear in... Um, the council packet uh, back in July, and um, it, basically the grand jury did um, a little study of different agencies in Ventura County, uh, 
they put together a, a bunch of findings and um, on here one of the pages they uh, uh, made uh, some positive remarks about the program that we have with bicycle bicycle or our bicycle program in Thousand Oaks so that's just something we want to let you be aware of uh, but there's no um, action on this yeah I just do have one thing that that I noted going through that and that on page 34 they they have 10 bicycle accident accident deaths I never would have thought it was this is over since uh, February of uh, 2013 to uh, May of 2014 uh, I don't see any data past that but but during that period there's 10 deaths uh, three people were wearing helmets the other seven not only one was female the others were all male and I'll tell you the age range is kind of shocking because there was only two kids 12 years old uh, three people in their 40s uh, two people in their 60s two people in their 70s I should say four people in their 40s so even the older people do things unsafe it seems like even more so than the children so I say anything we can do to help uh, make people more aware of bicyclists and you know who has the right of way and who you should be looking out for is is a good thing one of the comments <clears throat> about um, those adults who are not wearing helmets when the bicycle advisory uh, committee was first formed they one of their missions is to educate the public and one of the things they were trying to do was to um, get it out there that the the adults should wear helmets too and there was a lot of attempts to um, go to people's churches to go to employers and to meet with the people the kind of the demographic that is not wearing the helmet and it, it nobody would show up nobody would come they weren't able to get the message out there because nobody showed up. So I, it's, a, it's a real frustration, and, and these are really sad statistics. But there had been attempts made uh, in, the, in the past. Um, <clears throat> are there any other comments, Commissioner? Just as an informational item, um, are our uh, traffic sensors able to detect bicycles? Yes, uh, we do have um, a lot of our signals have uh, what we call video detection. And so with the video detection, um, we've uh, adjusted the sensitivity at uh, a lot of these. Generally, it's going to be for the left turn lane because those are the ones that we get the request for the uh, signal to by, by cyclists that the uh, arrow doesn't come up. So we've uh, routinely gone out with... Uh, the residents or the cyclists who've who've asked that uh, we've adjusted sensitivity um, and and uh, try to accommodate them as best we can. Thank you. Okay, so item eight C, the bat recommendations. That's an information item. Are there any questions or comments on that? Okay. Um. <clears throat> And then item nine, the status report of prior traffic commission recommendations. Are there any questions or comments on that? Okay, moving along. Commission referrals uh, from May 20th, 2015. There were none. Um, <clears throat> item 11, our work program and uh, commission schedule. Any questions or comments on that? Okay. Item 12, Traffic Commission comments or discussion? Commissioner Gregory? Um, yeah, I just want to take this time uh, to uh, thank uh, Rob McCoy for uh, nominating me for this position and the council for, or for voting for it. I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to serve this community. Um, hopefully my years of experience add some something you know to what we do um, all I know is this uh, we I know my fellow commissioners here you know we do spend our time going over the packets looking at things we're an extra set of eyes we try to make this uh, city a safer place 
Nobody ever comes up and says, thank you for putting that sign in or that crosswalk safely. You saved my life. So we don't expect a thank you. But when we don't hear a lot of deaths, we feel we're doing our job better than not doing it. Um, so, you know, we just constantly want to be improving that, and we realize there's a human element involved. So uh, I want to also compliment staff because they are professionals. They really look at the data. They do things. You know, uh, we don't do things that make things worse. We ease into them to make things better always. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, uh, traffic is always going to be a problem. <laughs> it just is. I mean, you have the human nature there. Um, you know, at that meeting, I did note that somebody tried to trivialize this, you know, traffic commission. And, uh, you know, he was uh, certainly, you know, entitled to his opinion. But I, I feel we do a good job and we are necessary because if nobody is making any changes, things would automatically get worse and we're talking about people's lives and injuries and you know somebody's dad or mom or kid and uh, if we can just save one life it's important and I think everybody here takes that quite seriously and we show up and we don't go to ball games and make excuses why we couldn't show up to the meeting that night and that kind of thing so you know we do do our due diligence and uh and, and i commend my fellow commissioners for you know con making their contributions and staff for being as professional as i could ever wish to work with you know people wise so i just want to add that and then there was one other thing that i would like to get on the agenda that i had brought up to jim morishigi that in my travels to other cities i thought might be a useful tool for us and 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 i don't want that you know to take up any time tonight but uh you know some communities face challenges and maybe they found a solution that we haven't so you know part of our job is maybe to, to bring that to staff and their unfortunate job is to have to take it serious enough to give us an answer on whether it would work or not but uh you know there's some roundabouts that i have uh, run into in my travels to oceanside and some other things that Jim, if you've got that, if you could maybe give me some kind of feedback during our next meeting on it, uh, you know, just what your impression is and, and if it can be used in any of our problem areas where we can't put a stop sign, we can't do this, we can't do that, because some of these uh, can be pretty effective uh, traffic calming measures. And, and basically, we haven't changed anything other than make somebody slow down or run into a curb, <laughs> basically. So I think most people are going to protect their car and slow down. Uh, and, and that affects human nature even when people don't want to. So I'm, I'm hoping this might be a solution, but I'm just the rookie, they're the expert. So maybe next time you could give us some, you know, when your time permits, give us some feedback on that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner? I'm addressing Mr. Finley. Could you explain to uh, the residents of Thousand Oaks how to contact your office in case they have traffic concerns rather than uh, feel their only venue is to write a letter to the editor? Absolutely. Um, you can actually call me directly. You can, you can go on a city's website and contact uh, any of the city employees, but I invite you to contact me directly. I'm the city engineer. Um, my phone number is 805-449-2399. Um, and you can also reach me by email at uh, cfinley, F-I-N-L-E-Y, at toaks.org. And uh, we, I will make sure your call is returned, and uh, we will have staff uh, look into the issues, as we did from the letters in the newspaper. Thank you. That was a great suggestion. Um, and Commissioner Gregory, we are really glad you're back. We really are. Thank you. Um, and let's see. Is there any other discussion? No? Okay. In that case, um, we will adjourn to the next meeting, 6.30 p.m., October 21st, 2015, in the boardroom of the Civic Arts Plaza on the third floor. Thank you. All right.